we have a large and varied panel for you. So uh, we have uh, myself chairing, uh, and then we'll be hearing first from Susanna Block, uh, who's one of our respiratory consultants at Imperial, then from uh, Brian O'Connor, uh, another respiratory consultant with a vast experience. And of course, this is mainly a respiratory disease. And then we're hearing from Dr. Ramsey Khamis, who's been leading uh, the COVID response uh, in uh, Imperial College. And from Charlotte Manisti, who works at uh, BARTS and at One Wellbeck. And of course, as you know, BARTS is now legendary in uh, being the main proponent of the uh, Nightingale Hospital and lending their armour uh, to the NHS, uh, which thankfully was uh, underutilised, which is much better than being overutilised. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Susanna. So Susanna, if you take over the screen uh, to get a, an introduction and then into the meat of COVID-19. So let's unmute and Susanna. Unmute myself. Oh. Hmm. Is that that's, uh, that's it. That worked? Yes? Brilliant, okay. Hello everybody, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, and thank you Iqbal for introducing me. I'm Susie Block, I'm one of the respiratory consultants at Imperial and I've got various different hats. Um, the relevant ones to this are that I'm the sort of acute respiratory failure lead, also do a lot of tracheostomy weaning and I'm one of the lung cancer lead as well. Um, so I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of what happened at Imperial and our experience of COVID over the last few months. It's difficult to know sort of what would be useful to tell you there's so very there's very much that we could talk about but so I'm just going to talk about a few little bits and then hopefully we can cover the rest in the questions. So over the last few months we've been busy as you can imagine um, and really by the middle of April we were completely overwhelmed or the beginning of April rather we were completely overwhelmed by COVID patients and although we only peaked at 353 in the trust and that's many less than our bed base really the whole trust was overwhelmed by only looking after COVID patients. Um, we had 148 ventilated patients, which is significantly more than three times the number of normal patients we would be ventilating in any different specialty. Um, and really, that's what we were up to. Overall, all the, all the patients who were admitted with COVID, the, the mortality was about 30%, which when I saw the data first, I found really quite shocking. So everybody coming in, 30% died. And that's much worse obviously if you are admitted to intensive care and although the intensive care data hasn't been finalized yet I suspect it will probably end up being about about 50 percent really just thinking about everybody who came in with COVID a mortality of 35 30 percent ish is really quite significant I think but having gone from a peak of 353 we now only have 95 patients still admitted which is obviously significantly better and we're busy preparing for the new normal and alongside preparing for the next peak but what did we do whilst we had all these patients in hospital? Well, to be honest, as you know, there isn't a treatment. So what did we actually do? And I think sometimes we all got a bit nihilistic about it and felt really all we were doing was giving a bit of oxygen and waiting to see what happened. And in a way, that is what we were doing. What we, would, what we had advantage of being able to do was assess the patients very carefully when they first came in and risk stratify them. And we got better at that the more we learned and the more patients we saw. We were able to monitor them very closely. And I think that's something that I definitely learned over my period is by recognizing the direction of travel of their illness and where they were on their COVID journey, you could really tell how somebody was going to, to go. And you had about a two day warning of them beginning to require more oxygen before they got really significantly worse. And that's the advantage of having the high risk patients in hospital, you can tell that. From a treatment point of view, as you know, we just enrolled people as much as we possibly could in all the trials. And from somebody who's done a bit of clinical research before, I've never seen as many trials get off the floor as quickly as possible with the most incredible support from the academics and the, re the recruitment nurses, etc. It was really remarkable. And from a ventilation point of view, I was involved in opening the CPAP unit. And this is one of our patients who's pleasingly a member of our staff and who did really well and got better. And he doesn't mind me sharing his photo because after all, he was on the BBC News, which we were quite proud of. Um, and he got better. CPAP versus ventilation versus high flow nasal oxygen, it's all very controversial. I'm sure you've heard about the Mercedes stuff from the, um, the news and things. And we still genuinely don't know the answer about what is the best way to support these patients and but hopefully we're getting a little bit closer and understanding a bit more 
I think one thing that we could do and did make a difference with and we did learn and I know that Brian's probably going to talk about this a bit more afterwards, is that these patients really have a, 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 a voracious clotting disorder. And that was noticed initially more and more as patients came in and would be okay, be okay, and then suddenly die. And we began to learn relatively quickly um, that this was often caused by large peas. And so our approach to prophylactic anticoagulation became uh, much, much more aggressive than in normal diseases of any sort really and we were using double or triple or full anticoagulation as prophylaxis based really only on the d-dimer this is just a small clot in this patient but what was interesting about this patient is she also had a large atrial thrombus um, and in a peri situation was thrombolized on itu and then actually did very well following that so we thought we were very busy in hospital but what happened out of hospital after we have to remember that actually most patients with covid aren't admitted at all um, but we um, know that our community GPs who are supported by a community service ran by Dr. Elkin were enormously busy and this is the number of patients who were calling in to the, uh, to the GPs locally to us. And we ran a respiratory advice line uh, supported by the respiratory consultants and various of our shielding registrars as well. And the questions that we were getting really from the GPs are what you would expect. And I'm sure there may be the same questions that you might have for us tonight. They're about persisting symptoms, abnormal observations, when to get help, the appropriateness of referring into sec secondary care and things like that. And I'm hopefully we'll be able to answer some of those questions over the next hour. I think the points that are important from our algorithm for me are pulse oxygen monitoring is really uh, important and useful and by the time you've got saturations of less than 94 percent or by the time you're desaturating in a significant way you really need assessment and you need to be admitted to hospital or at least assessed in a hot site to make sure that you're okay and stable and the other thing is what i've touched on before is that you need to keep an eye on these patients over time you need to check on their trend and what trajectory that they're going in um, to make sure that they're not getting worse and I think that's easy in hospital I think it's probably very difficult in the community what is happening at the moment what are we doing now well pleasingly most people are getting better this is the same patient that we've talked about before and I showed you the CT of and she had that x-ray on the left just before she was admitted to intensive care and this one just a few weeks later and that's obviously very pleasing. We've got a follow-up clinic and we're following up people about a month after their uh, discharge from hospital and although most of them are getting better, most of them are still not well. More than 80% still have some symptoms or other, mainly they still have abnormal chest x-rays although their chest x-rays are getting better but they mainly they are not desaturating significantly. They're just left with the feeling of exhaustion and these other symptoms that are listed here. The follow-up clinic is useful. We picked up a few patients who we've had to refer urgently to our cardiologist. We've done a, ver a few CTPAs looking for clots that might have been missed, but fortunately haven't found any yet. And we're most of the about 30% of the patients we're discharging at the moment, and those who have anything worrying or any remaining symptoms, uh, we're asking to. Um, come back and see us again in another few months time. I think as the ITU patients come out of hospital, we'll be caught more with significant changes in uh, spirometry exercise tolerance as we pick up more of the surviving patients who had really severe ARDS. We're not seeing them yet because they are still in hospital. Just last two slides, what about the rest of our respiratory patients? My mainly, my normal day job is in lung cancer and you, I'm sure you guys know that the presentations of any normal respiratory or any other conditions have fallen off massively. This is the trend in two-week waits over the last few few months and we're getting about 25% of our normal referral volume. It makes me very anxious as to what the next few months are going to be like for our lung cancer patients. Um, so I just urge people to refer in if you're worried because we are starting to set up on our pathways. We can get urgent two-week waits referrals sorted out and we can make sure these patients are now uh, getting the treatment that they need. So we've been able to set up uh, clean or COVID protected hubs to do our cancer surgery and things like that. Um, so that's reassuring. Last to end on a point, this is one of our other patients who didn't mind us sharing his picture and he's a patient who admitted to intensive care really thinking that he was going to die. Uh, he then came back down to us about four weeks later back into the to our unit with a tracheostomy. When he arrived he was 
very delirious, post ITU delirium, and I really felt very just depressed and miserable about him. But actually, within only 10 days of coming back down off the unit, he's decannulated, standing with our physios here, looking great, smiling, and he's now been discharged and coming back to the follow up clinic in a few weeks' time. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we'll take questions at the end. I see that uh, the uh, audience is revving up. Send those questions in. I'm collating them. So can I move over to uh, Brian? So uh, Brian, uh, are you uh, ready to go? Yes, just bear with me one second. Fantastic. So we'll get Brian to share his screen and, uh, and launch in. Right, well, unlike the other three panelists, I'm not a frontline worker and haven't done any frontline work for many years. I'm here as a general respiratory physician in full-time private practice to talk about some of the issues around COVID and COVID anxiety and access for patients from the community for respiratory investigations. I have a, one or two claims to fame in relation to this. I am a coronavirus survivor. I had it very early on in March, never severe, never ill, but very unwell. And I think the first patient ever at the Cromwell Hospital where, where I have my inpatients to have coronavirus was the one who infected me. He ended up going to Chelsea and Westminster Hospital where he was ventilated and almost died. He subsequently came back to the Cromwell where despite being on oral anticoagulants, managed to have multiple pulmonary emboli, which responded to high dose, low molecular weight heparin, but not oral anticoagulants. And I would slightly take issue with our chair at the, at the outset when he said that COVID-19 is a respiratory disease. It's a disease that manifests itself with respiratory symptoms because the portal of entry is via the respiratory tract. But some of us might argue that it's a vascular disease. Certainly, the uh, severe comorbidities appear to have a vascular basis to it. And of course, like all of us here on the panel and everybody listening in, what do we know about COVID? We only know as much as we're seeing and learning on the hoof, as it were. So I was out for the month of March, came back on the 9th of April to be faced with a relative deluge of patients with post-COVID symptoms or COVID anxiety or a, a lot of concerns. And unlike many in the private sector, because I'm a respiratory physician, I guess, I saw quite a lot of patients, certainly in the first couple of weeks. I saw them all by video consult for all the obvious reasons. And so what I want to highlight to you, what, what do we do about patients in this COVID era with respiratory symptoms? Well, the nature of COVID is such that um, all of our respiratory patients, they will have symptoms that are possibly due to COVID infection. And so therefore we have to assume that they are COVID-19 infected until confirmed otherwise. And as I've said to you already, the initial consultation must be by remote video link or whatever rather than face-to-face, -face, because I think it's in the interest, A, of the patient, and B, of the healthcare staff who might be looking after that patient to keep them well and safe. And so what I've done, and I'm giving you really an account of my practice, invariably, we would kick off with a video consult. And in the first couple of weeks, nobody, nobody came to the hospital, because you will remember in March, April, and in fact, up until early May, swabbing and all the rest of it, antibodies were not available. And patients were very scared and they didn't want to come into hospital. And in fact, most of the video, most of the problems could be resolved with video consultation and assuring a lot of people that they didn't have COVID or if they did, it was very mild. But then again, what did I know about COVID other than from personal experience in, in mid-April? What I was telling patients then was, yes, you may have chest pain. Yes, you've lost your sense of smell and taste. Yes, you're a little bit breathless. Yes, you're not sleeping very well or you're sleeping to excess. You've got dizziness, you have skin rash, you have all those symptoms that we all have now learned to know and become aware of. But I was telling them then that 
it would only be a four to six to eight week illness. Now I'm seeing patients who have had very mild COVID proven infection dating back to March and April, who are still unwell 12 weeks later. And they need to come into hospital as much for reassurance as anything else if they've got mild disease. So how do we get them in and investigate them? Well, in the respiratory sphere, almost everything we do is potentially high risk, forgive the spelling error, because lung function is an aerosol generating procedure. Bronchoscopy, if we choose to do it, is an aerosol generating procedure. And any patient going into the CT scanner, which we've had to do on occasion, must be COVID negative because we don't want to contaminate the scan. And the other thing that we need to remember is respiratory patients in general are vulnerable. So they have to feel that they're coming to a COVID clear environment. What are the chest symptoms we might see in the COVID era? Well, as we've all learned over the past six, eight weeks, all the non-COVID medicine seems to have disappeared, but it hasn't gone away, obviously. Asthma, our asthma patients aren't coming to us. How do we manage COPD? Because we were told to avoid steroids, avoid steroid-based inhalers. What about our bronchiectatic patients? Are they more vulnerable than most if they were to get COVID? So that a lot of my practice is based around that. And don't forget, this is the hay fever season. And what do hay fever patients have? They have sneezing, they have blocked nose, they have loss of sense of smell and taste, they have headaches, they feel feverish, they're tired, and they're short of breath with cough, and they think they have COVID. So it can be quite challenging, as I say, for people with, at the milder end of the COVID spectrum, and to, to try and dissuade them from the possibility that they're going to deteriorate and to prove to them that either they haven't got COVID or if they've had it, it's only very mild. And thankfully, with the advent of rapid access, well, not so much rapid access, but reasonable access swabbing, which now can be turned around in, in the private sector in under 24 hours, which probably still is a little suboptimal, it means that we can go and investigate and reassure these patients. I'm not going to go much into true COVID-related disease because I've not seen enough of it to be able to speak with any authority other than I've spoken to you briefly about mild COVID. But the reality is, and I'm hearing this from my colleagues and the one or two patients I've seen who've had severe COVID, they do require a lot of support. What is quite striking in the two patients I've seen, including the guy who almost died when he was ventilated in Chelsea and Westminster, is they recovered very rapidly and the post ITU syndrome that most people experience following prolonged ventilation didn't occur in either of my two patients. They're now back up and fairly mobile and they don't have any residual post-COVID disease. But a lot of people have had extensive thromboembolic disease, you have post-COVID fibrosis. And so there's going to be a whole, dare I say, industry, a whole new subspecialty of treating COVID patients. And we have um, NICE and BTS guidelines on how to follow the patients up. There are some patients who will be forever oxygen dependent. There will be others who have had a near-death experience and have recovered, but will have all of the post-traumatic stress of that, the stress of ITU and all the rest of it. So there is a huge, huge burden of support and follow-up that will happen as a result of COVID. And then again, there is the issue of dealing with the, the, the non-COVID respiratory disease. And how do, we, how do we do it all? I don't know how we're doing for time. Anyway, as I said, investigating chest disease in the COVID era is tricky. Physiology tends to be aerosol generating, so they all have to be COVID negative. We can do things like six minute walk tests, and I suppose cardiopulmonary exercise tests could be done. Sleep labs have pretty much disappeared off the face of the earth. So sleep medicine has, has taken, taken a back seat. We now have very well established guidelines for bronchoscopy, which, which thankfully at the last iteration of the British Thoracic Society have made them um, are, are less onerous than they were before. But you know, as, uh, as Susie said, lung cancer hasn't gone away. We have to be able to investigate. We have to be able to follow up our patients with interstitial lung disease. We have to be able to manage all of the chronic respiratory disease 
But I would stress that patients with lung disease, if they're going to come back to our hospitals, whether it be NHS or the private sector, they have to have a level of comfort and reassurance that they're coming to an environment that's going to keep them free of COVID. And of course, our staff also need to know that the patients are coming in with respiratory symptoms are also COVID negative. And so a COVID negative swab is essential for both patients and staff. And that's really as much as I want to say, these are really just headlines and highlights that I hope would provoke some questions afterwards about the reality of, if you like, office-based practice for a respiratory physician in the private sector during this COVID era where there's a hell of a lot of anxiety. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Brian. Uh, that was uh, that was fantastic. Uh, the voice of experience, and uh, I'm very pleased that you've been so busy. I've had to create video content and other things that don't affect patient care uh, because I've been so bored at the start of this. We're we're now revving up, though. So, talking of revving up, here comes Ramsey. Uh, so, Ramsey Hamis is uh, our co-head of the. COVID response in cardiology and uh, has been working tirelessly to make sure that we can service the, uh, the cardiac community. So Ramsey, uh, not only a, a cardiologist, but a boffin, away you go. Thank you, Iqbal. Uh, can you see my slides? Hello, Iqbal, can you see Yeah, we slides? can, I can, we can see them. Okay, thank you very much. So good afternoon, good evening everyone. So I'm Ramsey Kamis. I also wear several hats. Um, I'm currently the co-head of cardiology at Imperial, but I'm uh, also uh, an interventional cardiologist mainly, and I lead the high-risk atherosclerosis and cardioimmune clinic at Imperial. And when this whole thing started, um, I was asked to lead on the inpatient response in cardiology and Really, the, the, the last 10 weeks feel like more like 10 years. And so when the whole kind of, you know, the first week of the COVID response, we all stopped being cardiologists and we all kind of became a bit like dad's army here. And um, you can see Iqbal there on the right smiling um, and uh, looking uh, like he's not concerned. So keep calm and carry on. And I think we did a good job, but what we did was we really reorganized ourselves. We um, set up an inpatient command and control group where we had to really rechange everything that we do, change the ward, what it looks like. We started getting the right PPE. We, we wrote new ECS guidelines and pathways and that, that have been used internationally now. And we've changed the rotors, we've changed our cath lab operations. We've coordinated regionally with the UNIS to see what, what's going to happen. And we started a staff wellbeing program with about, um, you know, at, at, at any point there were one or two consultants off with COVID. And then we started this whole new revolution of using IT for our ward rounds. And that was kind of the upsurge. And, and uh, you don't need to look at this in detail, but this is the kind of work that we started. We started changing our pathways, especially for heart attacks and how to deal with COVID. And we all started looking like this. So this is me scrubbed uh, 10 days ago during um, um, a patient. Unfortunately, I lost this patient. So one of the sad stories in COVID is that a lot of people died. And um, uh, this is me scrubbed during a case, uh, primary angioplasty, um, the lady that clotted her LED, her husband died of COVID only four weeks previous and, and she came in very unwell. And the, the point is that we were open for everyone and we, we, you know, even if you had COVID or didn't have COVID, we tried our best. Unfortunately, uh, the family lost both parents. And I couldn't save her, but it's, you know, it's kind of, you know, one of these things and you carry on with life. So. Cardiac morbidities as adverse risk factors in COVID-19 patients. We heard a lot about this and about the risk. And actually, the most three common comorbidities reported in the first published Wuhan cohort were hypertension, diabetes, and coronary heart disease. And following from that, now we know that uh, about a fourth of the, of the non-survivors and only 1% of the survivors had a history of coronary heart disease, which gives you an odds ratio of 21, massive. So if you've got coronary disease and you had COVID, you, you had a much higher risk of not surviving the disease. And uh, a recent meta-analysis uh, of six studies identified uh, that about one, so 17%, about one fifth of patients had um, COVID in, as a pre-existing condition. Um, and unfortunately, 
uh, in patients who required intensive care, also cardiovascular disease really featured and uh, the incidence was default higher. So um, in terms of chronic heart failure as well, we know that, you know, obviously they're vulnerable patients and we just don't know the mechanism yet, but we know that the risk of COVID-19 infection may be higher in these patients. And so that's another um, factor there. So common post-COVID symptoms in terms of primary care, and now we are kind of pretty much in the post-COVID era where we are, we are seeing post-COVID, more post-COVID rather than COVID patients. And the four things that I'm seeing in the being referred to the cardioimmune clinic urgently are people with persistent breathlessness, palpitations, persistent chest pain, dizziness, and maybe presyncope as well. And, and the rest you heard from uh, our respiratory colleagues um, a little bit about, but you know, these are the four main complaints being referred to uh, cardiology. And they all have explanations. So I'm just, uh, Iqbal said to me, Ramsey, don't do much science, but I think just a touch, touch of science, a bit of cartoon science to just kind of give you an idea of why we think COVID affects the cardiovascular system. Uh, really, it's a cytokine surge. So, you know, with this infection, you get a massive surge of pro inflammatory cytokines, including tumor necrosis factor and IL 6. And this can cause myocarditis. So, it can, you know, it can have an effect on that. But also, if you've got um, plaque there, so if you have atherosclerosis already and you have a cytokine surge, you're likely to get uh, inflamed plaque and also you know the, the physiological stress of the infection itself so much more likely to have a myocardial infarction, rupture plaque, thrombosis, heart attack etc. There is a very interesting interface with the lungs in terms of clotting and Susanna was talking about uh, pulmonary embolization and we're still looking at the um, kind of really underlying cause of that you know, it could be vasculitis, it could be inflammation in the vessel itself, it could be just um, uh, hypercryglipathy in the blood itself. And actually, most recently, uh, there is now some evidence that there is endothelial infection with the virus itself, although the, the Lancet paper that was published two weeks ago has now been rebutted and saying it's not. But there is some kind of evidence that there is endothelial infection directly with COVID-19. And just going through uh, these things, so with acute coronary syndromes, what you've got to remember is that what we think is COVID-related deaths, 48,000 patients, is probably a lot higher. So this is actually from the Office of National Statistics, showing that the difference in all-cause mortality uh, between the five-year average and this year, up till this point, up to two days ago, is, is, is huge. It's 62,000 patients difference. And there's so another 12,000 patients that are not accounted for. And it may be that these patients are having cardiovascular events at home. It may be that they are dying of, of different things. But what we did at Imperial is that very early on, we ran a campaign with the British Heart Foundation. I think I was on four or five different news channels telling people that we are there for you. And if you do have chest pain, even though COVID is there, we are still open for business, you know, call 999 and come in. And it's really, really important for you to drive that message to your patients that if you've got heart attack symptoms, you know, severe chest pain, feeling very unwell, call an ambulance and we are still open, we're still there. And we are safe as well. So we ran this Imperial College COVID-19 seminar uh, and it's available online. I can send you the link and it was a four hour extended seminar. Uh, looking at all of these things and, and that could be av made available to you and I'll ask Rupert to send the link. So myocarditis, uh, there's a lot of talk about that and it appears in COVID-19 patients several days after uh, initiation of fever. It uh, kind of may be due to, as I said, the cytokine surge, could be respiratory failure and hypoxia also driving kind of uh, damage to the heart and it could also be related to upregulation of the ACE2 um, receptor in, in the heart and coronary vessels. And that's still unclear, but we're definitely seeing some myocarditis, even though it might not be leading to the mortality in these patients. The next thing to talk about is arrhythmias. So why would um, COVID-19 cause arrhythmias? Well, it's actually a complex interaction of different things. The first thing is that it really has a direct effect on the sympathetic 
nervous system via the cytokine storm. So you get sympathetic hyperactivity, uh, the vagus nerve stops suppressing the arrhythmias that usually suppresses in the heart, and then you get people getting palpitations and, and arrhythmias. Also, some of the drugs, and as you all know, uh, our uh, friend uh, Mr. Trump is taking hydroxychloroquine, which can cause QT prolongation. I'm sure he's having daily ECGs, but that could be there could be some side effects with drugs as well. Um, this is a halter taken from a post-COVID patient. This halter was done remotely um, at Welbeck, where there is a very nice remote service for that. And you can see here that this patient, actually, he had 13% topic, uh, topic load post-COVID. And you can see here um, uh, trigeminy, uh, ventricular trigeminy, uh, very symptomatic. So it was treated uh, um, with beta blockers is much better now, and hopefully once the COVID all settles, he'll, he'll, he'll be cured from this. Um, obviously looking for myocarditis and myocardial injury is important here. So coming on to the next thing, which is the real big deal, and I think Susanna started touching on this, is um, the interface between the pulmonary circulation and, and the lungs, and we, we, we saw a whole load of increased D-dimers, and really the pulmonary intervascular cryoglobopathy and, and, and the microplots in the pulmonary circulation are important. We're also seeing pulmonary emboli, micropulmonary emboli, but we're really um, uh, now starting to see some patients with pulmonary hypertension with increased pressures in the pulmonary arteries secondary to either the lung injury or micropulmonary intravascular cardiopathy or actually true pulmonary embolization. And we treat these patients differently according to what they present with. And obviously there is the aspect of in severe COVID uh, progressing to heart failure due having having had either myocarditis or acute coronary syndrome. So there's a lot of pathology that can happen. And the main symptom to look out for here is persistent breathlessness in the context of having recovered from, from COVID. And, and obviously this is an interface between respiratory and, and cardiology. Um, we're going to move on to Charlotte, who's going to show you a lot of very nice images, but this is one of my post-COVID patients. And one image here from the MRI shows three pathologies. So he's still got the lung changes with loculated effusions. He's got the D-shaped um, here um, um, uh, septum, which shows pulmonary hypertension. And he's um, um, basically uh, got also some, uh, some myocarditis. But we're going to come to that with Charlotte. Just one last slide about hypertension and COVID-19, because I think it's very important. Uh, the prevalence of pre-existing hypertension is higher in COVID-19 patients who develop severe disease, but there's no clear evidence that using ACE inhibitors of ARBs leads, uh, leads it um, up to the upregulation of the ACE2 receptor, which is the receptor that the virus bands in human tissues. And actually, in 9,000 patients, there was no harm in um, ACE inhibitors or ARBs with, in hospital mortality. And now the guidelines uh, are clear that you shouldn't stop these uh, drugs in patients with COVID uh, or at risk of COVID. So um, coming on to the end of my talk, I'd like to thank you for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. And just one last very important comment is that today is Iqbal Malik's birthday. So it's amazing that he's hosting the seminar for us. I'd like to wish him a happy birthday to my big brother and amazing person, Iqbal. And thank you for hosting us tonight. Thanks for listening. Thanks, thanks very much, Ramsey, and thanks for showing me I'm getting older as well. Uh, so uh, we'll take the questions at the end and uh, we'll move on to Charlotte Manisti, who's I think going to do a case-based discussion. So Charlotte, away you go. Great, thank you. It's a uh, great pleasure to be here. Um, as Iqbal mentioned, I'm a consultant cardiologist at Barts, and I also have a couple of hats. So uh, I've been working as a ward consultant on the COVID wards, doing a one in four on the COVID wards at Barts. <coughs> Also, I uh, am a non-invasive cardiologist looking after cardiac imaging, heart failure and cardio oncology, but I'm also co-PI on a 750 participant uh, study of asymptomatic healthcare workers with serial um, blood and uh, viral PCR swabbing done weekly intervals um, for 16 weeks through the COVID crisis to give us more insight into early um, poorly symptomatic or asymptomatic disease and generating a biobank of resources which are being shared between about 15 to 20 different research groups across the country to try and give us different insights into milder disease 
because most of the studies currently being run in the UK for COVID are focusing on the hospitalized patients. And so this is to try and get some insights into early disease. So when I was kind of thinking about what as a GP you would be seeing in terms of COVID and cardiovascular disease, the scope is actually quite different to what we're seeing in hospital. So you will presumably being asked questions about your patient, by your patients with cardiovascular disease about aspects um, to do with risk reduction. And obviously I'd like to highlight the normal standard um, Public Health England recommendations um, and obviously track and trace will come in to play here. But also about how to manage cardiovascular disease in the COVID area, era um, in terms of accessing facilities. So from our point of view as hospital cardiologists, we rely normally under normal circumstances quite heavily on community cardiology um, for heart failure nurse support, those kind of um, aspects. And we're not able to access us at the moment. And patients are often reluctant to come up for follow-up appointments. So we're relying far more on um, remote uh, telemonitoring and telemedicine. Um, and we're having to totally rework our pathways as Ramsey mentioned. The other aspect is that, of course, in hospital, we're seeing patients with many of the acute cardiovascular um, effects of COVID. So Ramsey's mentioned some of these, but there are also likely to be some chronic cardiovascular effects uh, as well. And Brian has talked about the chronic post-COVID syndrome where patients are breathless um, in the medium to long term afterwards. And there are going to be cardiovascular uh, long term effects beyond the acute um, COVID hospitalization. And you as GPs are going to be seeing many of these patients who will have unexplained breathlessness or breathlessness that cannot be put into a single category. And these are going to be quite challenging patients to manage in this particular era. Um, and finally, you, there are going to be patients who present to you with new cardiovascular symptoms that are entirely unrelated to COVID and managing that and getting those patients investigated, diagnosed and uh, treated appropriately is a challenge in the current COVID era. And hopefully I'll show you some of the things that we're doing to try and make that more straightforward for you. But in the first instance, I thought I'd share with you just to highlight what this can do, what this disease can do to young, healthy, asymptomatic people. This was a 27 year old um, Afro Caribbean gentleman with absolutely no comorbidities, no past medical risk, uh, history at all, who was admitted at really the peak of the COVID era. So uh, three days after lockdown, essentially a week after lockdown, um, with classic symptoms of cough, fever, hemoptysis. He was admitted to the Royal London A&E. He was mildly hypoxic. His inflammatory markers were as expected. His D-dimer was elevated, but his troponin was normal at that time. He was kind of pretty much immediately diagnosed with COVID um, and we were um, kind of not particularly uh, excited about this. He was treated appropriately for this by with hospitalization, oxygen, et cetera. And he then had had a CTPA because he raised D-dimo and his persistent hypoxia and was found not unexpectedly to have a pulmonary embolus for which he was anticoagulated. His hospitalization was eight days long and he was discharged home well with his inflammatory markers completely normalized. Unfortunately, 20 days after discharge, he was then readmitted and at this point he was in extremis. He had a respiratory rate of 40, a heart rate of 160, um, with a blood pressure of 100 systolic and he was um, significantly uh, febrile. His inflammatory markers were through the roof again um, and he had a raised D-dimer but not significantly elevated and he had a CTPA done on admission and his pulmonary emboli had actually almost completely resolved with the anticoagulation that he was discharged on. But at this point his troponin was high. His troponin was 309 and our upper limit of normal is 14 but his ECG was normal. So he was sent for an echocardiogram and I don't think you really need to be a cardiologist to be able to see that this gentleman's, um, uh, sorry about that, his, this gentleman's ejection fraction was about five to 10%. So in an otherwise healthy, uh, um, sport loving Afro-Caribbean gentleman, this was a really striking abnormality. Um, he was going downhill fast. And so he was immediately admitted to ITU. And then within 24 hours, we put him on VA ECMO, so extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So that's a kind of mechanical support device that not only helps the circulation um, and helps improve cardiac output, but also oxygenates the blood as well. Um, and this is really reserved for the very sickest of patients. It was put on that within 24 hours of admission. He was also given intravenous steroids because as Ramsey described, the 
more delayed COVID response tends to be more a more inflammatory cytokine uh, related response. And so he was given intravenous steroids and actually quite quickly, the second cardiogram was within six days of admission. So you can see that really fairly quickly his cardiac function improved. He then, a few days after that, when he was well, he was on the ward, he was extubated, he had underwent a cardiac MRI scan. Um, cardiac MRI scans allow us not only to look in detail at the structure and function of the heart, but they also allow us to look at the tissue characterization, so to almost give a non-invasive biopsy of what's going on within the myocardium. And we can measure the levels of water in the tissue, and so we're able to tell that this uh, patient had edema or inflammation in the myocardium as would be consistent with myocarditis and then he had some scarring uh, in the um, epicardium uh, you can see here in the arrows this is very consistent with myocarditis but what's fairly amazing is that within two weeks his uh, myocardium had resolved almost back to normal again but it's not just myocarditis. As Ramsey's outlined, these patients oft can often have multiple complications. And this was a patient that was admitted to us down the STEMI pathway. And you can see on his angiogram that he had an occluded um, LAD quite clearly. And um, uh, he also had thrombus seen here um, uh, in the proximal vessel. And that was uh, stented. Um, but alongside that, he also had a thrombus in his aorta. He had a pulmonary embolus, so it's not shown very clearly then. And there on his cardiac MRI scan, we can see that not only does he have uh, uh, um, an infarct, but also the patient has quite significant myocardial edema throughout their whole myocardium, showing that they have myocarditis as well. So this patient had four separate complications as a result of their COVID. Um, um, and actually, they were not that unwell with this, but there are multiple complications that these patients get. So from a cardiology point of view, the European Society of Cardiology has given us some guidance about how to um, manage patients with cardiovascular disease during the COVID pandemic. But I probably recommend you don't actually read it. It's about 60 pages long and it's quite detailed. Um, but there's actually quite a good summary in the BMJ this week. But in, in, in really broad terms, the things that they highlight that I think are relevant to you are that um, if you see a patient who's got uh, symptoms of chest pain or any other cardiovascular symptoms, do not be put off by the fact that they may or may not have COVID. ECG diagnostic criteria for cardiovascular conditions are unchanged, so you should treat your patient as normal. If it looks like it might be a cardiac problem, their ECG is showing a cardiac problem, don't get put off by the fact that COVID is around and treat that patient as you would do normally but troponin and BMP may be elevated with COVID and indeed are strong prognostic markers. If in the patients that we see who have got high uh, troponins, we know that those patients will do badly and the troponins seem to rise throughout the disease course um, in very sick patients and those are the patients that tend to do, to do really badly. Just moving on from that to management, if you've got patients with coronary disease, there was some suggestion at one stage that antiplatelets should be stopped. Do not stop antiplatelets. If your patient's got coronary disease, continue those. And as Ramsey outlined, patients with hypertension or heart failure who are on ACE inhibitors or um, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, again, continue these medications. This uh, all arose because we know that the coronavirus binds to the ACE2 receptor on the lung cell membrane. And so it's thought that by giving ACE inhibitors or angiotensin uh, receptor blockers, you may increase the viral load and therefore increase the lung injury in these patients. But actually now we're getting good quality studies coming out and actually those are reassuring. This was a recently published study looking at a large cohort of patients from China where uh, patients who were severely unwell who received ACE inhibitors and ARBs were actually um, did better than those who didn't. So these were patients who were um, severely unwell and those not even correcting for cardiovascular, underlying cardiovascular disease, we see that those patients who are taking these drugs actually seem to do better. I'm not suggesting as a treatment, but what I am saying is please do not stop these drugs. So just moving on to cardiac imaging, um, here, when we're thinking about who to send for investigations and which investigations to do, there are two things really to point out, even from asymptomatic patients. We're trying obviously to avoid asymptomatic patients who have got uh, underlying COVID um, 
transmitting that infection to other patients. But we're also trying to minimize the risk of procedures in patients, even if they are asymptomatic. We've been seeing quite a lot of patients uh, at BARTS whose swabs come back uh, repetitively negative. Um, but for example, on uh, might have some abnormalities on their chest CT. Um, patients who are admitted for cardiac uh, surgery or other cardiac in investigations urgently, we know that those patients do worse if they've got underlying COVID. And so we will not uh, go ahead with the procedure until we know that um, that has been cleared. What I would say from the cardiovascular imaging perspective is if your patient does have COVID, you really should only be sending them for imaging if it will change your management and all investigations should be focused to answer the clinical question. So if you're doing an, if you're, if, if we're doing an echocardiogram, um, we will focus it, that on the question that has been asked. We won't necessarily do a full investigation in these, in these patients if we think that they've got COVID. And it may be that non-invasive approaches are preferable to invasive angiography. In patients who have had COVID who are persistently breathless, I would recommend echocardiography. We know that a large proportion of these patients will have had some form of cardiac involvement, be it myocarditis or other, and an echocardiogram is going to be very useful. So if you're seeing patients after they've been discharged from hospital and they remain breathless, think about the heart as well as the lungs. And if their troponin remains positive, then I would recommend that they undergo cardiac MRI because that will tell us whether they've got end, uh, evidence of myocarditis. And also possibly even more importantly, it will make sure that they have not had an ischemic or a thrombotic event, which we would be able to see on the MRI scan because obviously that would be treated differently. Um, I would say that in at the current time, we're trying to avoid exercise testing where possible, um, just because the heavy breathing is thought to be possibly aerosol generating. So we're trying to avoid exercise testing as much as possible. In terms of hospital investigations, we've been given quite clear guidance, both from the British Cardiovascular Society and in fact from um, the European Society of Cardiology about what should and shouldn't be done in the COVID era. And I think the important point is, is that none of the emergency or urgent investigations will be held up at the current time. In fact, they'll probably happen quicker because the normal work is not happening. Um, so if, you, if your patient needs an urgent or an emergency investigation, it will be done and it will be done quickly. Um, what all patients who are coming to all hospitals are having done is a nasal swab on admission and then it's being repeated at five to seven days. For elective urgent procedures, uh, all patients will be triaged appropriately um, and only those where it's urgent will they be brought into hospital for it. But patients are being recommended to self-isolate for two weeks if possible beforehand to ensure that they are COVID negative before that they come in. They then have a swab done 48 to 72 hours before they come into hospital. And if that's negative, then when they come in, they again have a symptom screen and temperature test. Um, and then if all of that is clear, they will go ahead and have their, their investigation. So for elective procedures, we're slightly more rigorous in most of the hospitals. And the final point that I really want to strongly emphasize is that we must encourage our patients not to suffer in silence at home. This was a patient who's a lady who I look after who has heart failure as a result of having anthracycline treatment for lymphoma about 10 years ago. Her left ventricular function is impaired, as you can see, and it has been for some time, but she'd been deteriorating at home. Um, we'd asked her to come into hospital. We'd done telephone consultations and it was clear that she needed to come into hospital, but she absolutely did not want to come. When she eventually came into hospital, you can see from this from her weight chart after we started diuretics, her dry weight is about 65 kilograms and she was 80 kilograms when she came in. So if you imagine the state that this lady had got into at home because she was terrified of coming into hospital. And I would strongly argue that hospitals at the moment are safer than you might think. This is data from our study, which was published in The Lancet a few weeks ago where we were doing viral PCR swabs for um, COVID in, this was data from the first 400 participants over the first five weeks. And what we could see was that whilst about 7% of healthcare workers were positive with COVID, albeit asymptomatic, at the time of lockdown, so at the peak of the pandemic, that very rapidly fell down to about 1%. And now we're analyzing our most, initial, our most recent data and it's far lower than that now. So very, very low rates of asymptomatic carriage within healthcare workers. But I think what's even more reassuring this data showed is that if you look at how it's tracking, 
this rate of decline in, uh, in asymptomatic um, COVID infection track the community rates and not the hospitalization rates. This blue line here is the number of patients within our hospital who, uh, who have COVID. And this is still, you know, it's coming down, but it's still significant numbers of patients. But what we could see is that the healthcare workers' uh, rates of infection were falling dramatically, despite the fact that these same people were looking after patients with COVID day in, day out. So they didn't seem to be getting infected to the same extent that one might expect. And this rate of decline was actually tracking community rates, whilst the hospitalisation rates stayed quite high. So here at One Welbeck, we're trying to do what we can to accommodate consultations as quickly as we possibly can and as safely as we possibly can. Um, we're doing, we're open for business. We're doing both remote consultations, which is obviously the majority, but there are some patients who we need to see in person. For those patients, um, both patients and staff will uh, be wearing, offered masks and wearing masks and uh, patients will be filling in a symptom questionnaire and make sure that they don't have any symptoms of COVID at the time of coming in. We're trying obviously to keep this as clean sight as possible. But importantly, what we're also offering is a one-stop cardiac assessment where uh, all the investigations can be done at the same time, meaning that your patient can come once, have all of their investigations done, and then can either see a clinician or could have a telephone consultation afterwards with the results of these investigations. For example, one of the things we're doing is the halter monitoring we're doing. The patients are being posted the halter monitor with a video and some instructions on how to fit that themselves. So if all they need is a halter monitor, then actually they don't even need to come into the building because that can again be posted back. Echocardiograms um, are being done uh, using um, the safest possible techniques and trying to minimise the length as much as possible so that uh, patient and staff contact is minimised. We're doing CT coronary angiograms, which is extra, extremely useful, obviously, in avoiding um, invasive angiograms if they're not strictly necessary and will reduce the risk. And we're obviously doing cardiac MRIs, which will tell us about the structure and function. They can tell us about uh, myocardial perfusion if there's any evidence of ischemia. And they can also look for scar in patients with myocarditis or potentially previous infarction. All of this can be done and it's going on at the moment and will hopefully minimise your uh, patient's visits to the uh, centre. But I, what I'd like to emphasise is that we've got a whole wealth of expertise here at One Welbeck and everybody is currently working and seeing patients with remote consultations and trying to get the investigations done and expedited and simplified as quickly as possible to make sure that your patients are investigated enough but are not exposed to increased risk by coming up to the centre. But any questions you've got, please fire away. We're here for you. Charlotte, thanks very much indeed. Uh, so uh, our speakers have given you an absolutely great roundup of what's going on. And uh, I think it's now up to us to uh, answer some of the questions that you've raised. Uh, time is slightly limited. If you have the capacity to stay an extra five minutes beyond uh, the seven o'clock finish, then we'll try and get through some of the questions. So let me kick off with some from the audience. Uh, uh, so the first one is uh, point of care testing in GP land. I think I'll ask everyone to be very brief. Uh, I would be very against uh, suddenly trying to try troponin and D-dimer testing in the community. Um, so uh, can I go to uh, Brian, who sees a lot of patients in the clinic? Um, do you think there's any value in these point of care tests in the community in GP land? Well, I don't know how valid point of care testing is in the community. I think for the worried well who are very anxious about, could I have a pulmonary embolus doctor in week 12 when they've had very mild COVID symptoms, if at all, a negative D-dimer would be reassuring for them. But any patients who've got significant cardiopulmonary pathology, they should really access the appropriate specialist. Uh, I think the other thing is that the D-dimer is, uh, is hypersensitive. And so uh, when it's up uh, unexpectedly, then that will lead to a lot more unnecessary investigation. So uh, may I move to Susie? Uh, Susie, uh, there was a question about steroids. You, I think one of us mentioned, or you mentioned, that steroid inhalers were sort of frowned upon. And then there is the issue about whether you should actually give a lot of steroids to prevent lung scarring. Uh, what's your feeling about both inhaled and tablet steroids and their timing? So I guess inhaled steroids, we definitely have not been telling our patients to stop their steroids. In fact, we've been making it very clear that much like antihypertensives, they should keep taking their steroids. And I think that's part of the reason why perhaps we've seen fewer admissions with COPD and asthma 
with COVID actually, because they've been managing it a bit better. Our community teams have been really supporting their our asthmatics and COPD patients at home. So definitely they should keep taking their inhaled steroids. As for sort of high dose steroids for treatment following COVID, um, we have looked really closely at that and the, have been trying to differentiate lead differentiate a bit between a sort of active fibrosis ground glass picture or organizing pneumonia on a CT scan versus an established fibrosis that will no longer be receptive to steroids. I don't think there's any good evidence out there yet what the right thing is. I certainly in the community wouldn't be giving high dose steroids or any prolonged course of steroids to anybody. Um, if you were to try that it has to be very carefully monitored, you'd want to be knowing what was going on with their lung function and have a good look at their HRCT first. Um, so I think in the acute phase when there's definite active ongoing inflammation and the beginnings of fibrosis, there may be an argument to start with steroids. But by the time they're in the community with an established fibrosis, you'd have to think very carefully before starting any steroids then. Okay, thank you. If I, if uh, I could just add to that, there is a, a trial about to start on the potential benefits of nintedomib in the post-discharge um, post fibrotic patients. But the, it's just a, the usual trial, but I totally endorse what Susie said, no steroids. Excellent. Okay, Ramsey, um, not to racially stereotype you, but you're probably more in tune as I am with uh, the BAME risk. So the government published yesterday a paper which was a little wishy-washy um, do you feel that the BAME risk uh, is related to the risk factors that the BAME population have, or is there something genetic? So that's really interesting, Iqbal. So um, there's five different facets to this. The first thing is that uh, the increased risk in the BAME uh, population was seen in the health workers to start with. And as it turns out, a lot more... Um, physicians and nurses on the front line are ethnic minorities um, in terms of if you compare it as a percentage of the total population. Um, so it was difficult to work it out from there. But if uh, you look at the data from New York, it seems that there's a um, correlation with uh, socioeconomic uh, status and uh, deprivation indices. And so, <laughs> you know, people picked up on ethnicity because it's easy to see. But what's not easy to see is access to health care and socioeconomic status and underlying health um, status. So um, if you go back to 1999, there's a paper from Bristol which caused John Major a whole lot of trouble headlines in the Times saying that um, you know people in poorer areas had um, a higher cardiovascular uh, mortality and morbidity and to mirror that um, ethnic minorities have the same and now we're seeing uh, with COVID um, a picture that reflects that I have not seen any data that links genetics however it is being studied and uh, if you remember we talked about the ACE receptor so um, in uh, black Africans um, the uh, ACE receptor is slightly different and there is now some studies looking at whether the interaction of the fact uh, of the virus uh, on the interface with the ACE receptor is different in different ethnicities but I, I should think it's multifactorial um, also um, just one kind of last point on that um, kind of you know very sensitive uh, subject is um, we 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 do not kind of really understand whether BAME populations seek help earlier or later when they are sick, and the whole kind of British Heart Foundation drive that we did with acute coronary syndromes made me wake up to that fact and actually if you have language problems on top of being scared in um, an environment that you feel that the government is kind of you know imposing rules and you don't want to break them and going to hospital might harm that might come into it where actually people might be more scared to seek help earlier on in a in a in a epidemic. Yeah, I think I think it is multifactorial, and uh, but there is definitely an elevated risk. I'm actually quite glad, uh, being BAME, that I'm not also an ENT surgeon because, of course, some of the first deaths were in ENT yeah. surgeons. Um, can I come to Charlotte? Charlotte, the um, so you've been exposed to COVID, you've survived COVID, exercise um, uh, post COVID. What do you think? 
So um, I think it depends on the level of exercise you're going to be doing and the sickness that how sick you've been at the time. Um, one of the questions that we are already being asked quite often, and I suspect as, as the GP community out there will be asked very often, is what to do as an athlete or what to do if you are a professional sportsman. Um, there's uh, been a few guidelines drawn up that have suggested uh, particular pathways. Um, and this was one that was drawn up by Sanjay Sharma, who many of you will know is a cardiologist specializing in sports medicine. He's the director of the medical director of the London Marathon and is very, very experienced at looking at um, professional sports people. And what he suggested to them is that if you've had a significant infection, so been debilitated for a week or so, or had symptoms that might be compatible with a myocarditis, so some chest pain during the uh, infection, that these patients must have echocardiograms and ECGs after uh, they've been discharged and whilst they're recuperating. And they should really only return to uh, uh, training once they've got a normal exercise capacity on an exercise. Um, right. Sorry. Ramsey, just very, very quickly, um, patients who have been hospitalised who are professional athletes, he suggests that they really do need to go through a full gamut of investigations before they get back to the stage of uh, exercising. And the main reason is that we know that patients with myocarditis, from normal myocarditis, we know that you should uh, refrain from exercising for three months after, ex after myocarditis um, because it leads to worse outcomes uh, if you start exercising before that. So I think there are some suggestions that professional athletes or those who are playing very regularly do need to have some investigations done um, after a significant COVID infection. So, so is, Iqbal, sorry. Yes, Ramsey. Yeah, so in the cardioimmune clinic, Iqbal, I'm telling patients that have had a troponin rise or evidence of myocarditis to not do any um, uh, cardiopulmonary exercise above uh, what's moderate. Uh, for three months, as we do with myocarditis. I just don't think we have a real idea of what the risk is, and especially if you've picked up an arrhythmia on 24-hour tape or on the ECG, either prior to discharge or as an outpatient, uh, there is a risk there, and I think we still don't understand the risk. And um, Charlotte obviously can help with risk gratifying with a cardiac MRI and, and then, you know, further on with an exercise test. But really, if you, if, you know, people want to exercise, in my view, uh, you know, uh, a whole thermometer is, is, is an important one to have because if there's an arrhythmia and you've had troponin positive event, you wouldn't want to be pushing it. I agree. Susie, um, can I just come back on the, uh, so we've had the, a cardiac view. What's the lung view? Are you going to damage your lungs if they're a little bit upset and you start exercising? I think with the lungs, it's a bit easier. Sort of, they're going to stop you before you can push it, unlike the heart, I think. Um, so from, from a pure lung point of view, I think um, it would be slow return to exercise following any sort of normal pneumonia with the understanding and what I keep saying to everybody is a normal pneumonia it's going to take you six weeks to get anywhere near back to normal this is a not normal pneumonia it's going to be a long time before you're ready to start exercising properly so I don't think you're going to damage your lungs in the same way you might damage your heart in your attempt obviously um, and I just think from a muscle rehab point of view following ITU as as everybody said actually these patients are recovering their muscle strength and their uh, post ITU much quicker than we would normally see but even even still, it's going to take them a long time and I think a gradual return to normal exercise would be what we would recommend. Fantastic. So I think I'll summarise there. We're, we've uh, run over by a few minutes, uh, but I think you'll agree that it's been a fantastic session and I've certainly learned a lot. Uh, so uh, I would say that the sort of unanswered questions, and I don't think any of us in the panel can answer it, is uh, which is the right antibody test because they're changing all the time. Uh, there's certainly a false negative rate and I suspect there'll be eventually a false positive rate. So uh, even if you are antibody positive, does that protect you from infection? No one is absolutely certain. So there's an uncertainty there. And actually, I, I suspect that in hospital, we've been slightly protected. Um, so after the first wave of infections hit, the, as Charlotte's shown, the wave of infection for people inside the hospital has been quite low as we've PP'd up. Now, uh, I fear for my GP colleagues because the guidance even in the hospital was, well, uh, frankly, shoddy. And we made it up and actually led from the front. And I think in GP land, it's probably been even worse, but perhaps smaller groups of GPs not being able to fight their corner 
and get the PP requirements that they needed. So I do worry about what I will be wearing and what my GP colleagues will be wearing when they're doing their GP consultation and also what the consulting room will look like. I have not yet done an outpatient clinic. I did one virtually this morning with 30 patients. Usually they'd be queuing up, sitting there, looking grumpy and probably catching COVID. So I think there's not going to be a normal uh, for some time, but hopefully we've proved useful in sharing some of the uh, things that we've been doing inside hospital and also what uh, we can share with how we can still uh, serve the patients that you're going to send to us. So I thank you all for attending and for the interaction and the questions that have been asked. And uh, thanks to Rupal who set this uh, webinar up and of course to Charlotte, Susanna, uh, 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 to Ramsey <coughs> uh, and to, uh, uh, yeah, oh my God, my brain's gone. Uh, Brian, was, Brian, Brian, Brian. There we go, and to Brian uh, to, uh, to actually lead from the front and, uh, and talk us through this. They've all been at the coalface working very hard and are major researchers. Um, there, oh yes, there was a question that Susanna's remind me about, about whether it was bat or lab that caused the start of this epidemic. I just don't think we're gonna have the 20 years to answer that question. And I believe not even Brian is tuned into the CIA or the FBI to give us some insights into that. So uh, with that, I will close and ask Rupal to shut down. We love your feedback if you could take it via Rupal and I thank you for joining us.